Day 1, the Narius Research Station is a secret undersea research facility that was built nine years ago. It's owned and run by the US, Navy, and located in the Western Pacific Ocean. More specifically, it's thousands of feet below the surface, on the edge of an ocean trench that plummets to 32,087 feet at its deepest point. Supposedly, the purpose of the Narius is to study microbial life forms and the effects of ocean acidification on them. Although I never believed that explanation, there's far too much secrecy surrounding it for that to be the case. How do I know all this? Because I was on my way there. As our deep sea submersible descended past the twilight zone, the first seed of doubt took hold and began to sprout. Back in my two bait, two empty house in Boston, I'd been sure that this was what I needed. Complete isolation from the rest of the world. A place where I could grieve privately, away from the prying eyes of my friends and co-workers. And frankly, I hadn't even expected them to pick me. I'd met all the basic requirements in the job posting. But better, more qualified candidates must have applied. Now, it was finally hitting me that once I arrived at the Nereus, I wouldn't be able to leave. Not until another doctor came to relieve me. Jack, the pilot of our submersible, must have seen the expression on my face. Don't you worry, he said, not unkindly. We'll be there soon enough. He had a shock of white hair and a face lined with wrinkles and crevices. He wasn't old, he was ancient but his hands were steady enough on the controls, and I tried to muster up a smile for him. Closer to the surface, the water had been so uniformly blue that I couldn't tell that we were descending. Here in the abyssal zone, absolutely no sunlight penetrated the water. It occurred to me again what an inhospitable environment the ocean was for human beings, and how little we actually knew about it. According to the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, more than 80% of our ocean remained unexplored. It was essentially an alien world within our own. There it is, said Jack. I followed the direction his gnarled finger pointed in and caught my first glimpse of the Nereus. I knew all the basic facts about it. Of course, it was a two-story structure roughly 8,000 square feet. The first floor consisted of a long tube divided into three main compartments, each sectioned off from the other via sliding doors. Six different pods then branched out from the entire first floor. They held sleeping quarters, bathrooms, a kitchen, a social space, and a sick bay. The second floor, connected to the first via a ramp, had a dozen pods branching off from it, and each other through a confusing warrant of long, narrow hallways. The second floor pods held wet and dry labs, computer workstations, and more. Up to 20 scientists could live in the Nereus at a time, but the description of the Nereus still hadn't prepared me for the actual sight of it. It was beautifully elaborate and defiant, something impossible lifted straight out of a sci-fi novel. By the time I managed to extricate myself from the submersible, I found the station leader already waiting for me, visibly impatient, Alexandra Morrow. Everything about her, from the no-nonsense look in her gray eyes to the brisk efficiency of her movements, screamed military, even though she didn't introduce herself. As such, she gave me a quick assessing look before saying, in clipped tones, I'll be giving you a tour of the first floor of the station. Follow me. Right, thank you. She was already striding down the hallway, and I had to break into a jog to catch up with her. A headache had developed sometime. In the past 30 minutes, and I struggled to follow along as Alexandra listed off the different sections of the station. The first compartment contained the submersible docking station, the next compartment was the entry lock, and the third one, the biggest, was the main lock. As far as I was concerned, only the following three areas mattered to me, the sick bay, the kitchen, and my sleeping quarters. The inside of the Nereus looked much older, and was more cramped than I'd expected. Glass cropped up in unexpected places, such as around the viewports or along the edges of power doors, and the lights kept flickering. Worst of all, an odd, dank smell permeated everything, insinuating itself into every corner and crevice of the station. It reminded me of the summer I'd spent living in a basement room while studying abroad at Cambridge. No matter what I'd done to try and eliminate it, it had stubbornly stayed until I left. Benjamin, Catherine, and Rose are the three scientists here at the moment, but there are always two technicians. Alexandra was saying when I tuned back in, they monitor the life support systems and fix the little things that break. Jonathan and Ellen, he will meet them all later. When do I get to meet Dr. Miller? Dr. Miller left two days ago. Here, this is where you will sleep. It's not crowded at the moment, so you have the pod to yourself. 
If that changes, however, I knew it wasn't a good idea to interrupt Alexandra, but the question burst out of me before I could stop it. Wait, what do you mean Dr. Miller left? I thought. I trailed off under Alexandra's piercing gaze, but I'd been counting on his guidance. He left very detailed notes, Alexandra said, with an air of finality. She reached out and opened the door that led to a small, cramped pod. Two bunk beds had been stuffed into it, and they were only a foot apart from one another. I couldn't actually imagine sharing the space with anyone else, much less three other people. Do me a favor, Dr. Weir, she said abruptly. Don't go on to the second floor of the Nereus. Without advance permission, do you have any other questions? I shook my head. She gave me a curt nod and left me standing there, clutching the duffel bag I'd packed with my meager belongings. This was going to be my home for the next six months. For better or worse, that night, I had a nightmare. Riley walking through the living room, jingling his keys in one hand. As he hummed tunelessly to himself, he paused abruptly and looked at me. His left eye had vanished. The eyelid hung limply over the empty socket. You need to leave, Cordelia, before it's too late. And then, he kept walking, up the stairs, down the hallway, into the bedroom. I heard the sound of the bedroom door slamming shut. I knew exactly what would happen next, but I couldn't move. An invisible hand pressed me down into the living room sofa, and as the seconds trickled by, it began to exert greater and greater pressure on me. It was squeezing me, like an orange it meant to squash flat. My skin went taut under the pressure, and then split, blood spraying in all directions. My eyeballs went next, first bulging, then popping out from the sockets. My organs were rupturing, the bones beginning to splinter and crack. The pressure relented as suddenly as it had started. Even without eyes, I could somehow look down at myself. My bones had turned into metal struts, and the muscles and tendons into thick metal wires wrapped around the struts. As I watched, flowers of rust bloomed along my body, huge orange-red petals unfolding over me. I tried to cry out for Riley. My jaw creaked open soundlessly, and the bottom half of it fell away with a loud screech, tumbling to the ground. It looked like a part of a steel jaw trap. I woke up with a gasp. The nightmare had been so real that I couldn't help checking myself for injuries, frantically patting my face. Reason gradually reasserted itself. I was on the Nereus, lying in the bottom bunk bed. I was here to replace Dr. Miller's, and I would stay here for the next six months and my husband had been dead for almost 12 months. I laid back down, shivering as the sweat cooled on my body. For the first time since I'd learned that I would be staying on the Nereus, I allowed myself to think of Riley, how he used to laugh, with one hand placed against his chest, as though to contain his laughter, the way his eyes would light up whenever he talked about fishing or bird watching. I used to joke that he was only interested in hobbies meant for old men. I even missed the little things that had annoyed me about him, like the fact I always had to say his name three or four times to get his attention. I, Cordelia, the voice came out sighing out of the darkness, and fear leapt through me, hot and coppery because that was Riley's voice, strangely garbled, as though he spoke through a mouthful of blood or water, but I would have known his voice anywhere. And that meant that I was having a nightmare, an extremely vivid and realistic nightmare. Never mind that I felt wide awake. My eyes strained to make out his face in the darkness. Nothing, except I thought I could see a slumped shape sitting on the bunk bed opposite mine, only a foot or so away. If I reached out, I was certain I could touch it. Do it, then. My mind screamed at me. Do it, and you'll see that there's not anything actually there. But I was too terrified to move. And what if there was something there after all? What then? He spoke again, flat and dispassionate. You need to leave, Cordelia, before it's too late. And then silence. Day 2. The next morning, with all the bright fluorescent lights on overhead, it was remarkably easy to convince myself that I'd simply dreamed up the sound of Riley's voice. Of course my dead husband hadn't appeared in the middle of the night to warn me about staying on the Nereus. The idea was laughable in the extreme. I told myself this, and carefully didn't look too closely at the bunk bed. The blanket did seem a little crumpled, as though someone had been sitting on it, but I might have accidentally done that last night. As I walked around the Nereus, headed towards where I thought the kitchen was, I marveled again at how normal everything seemed, aside from the lattices of rust and the occasional viewport that showed me the same unrelenting darkness. I almost could have believed that I was back at the surface. Riley would have loved the fact that I was working here, but the thought had barely flitted across my mind before I pushed it away. The kitchen ended up being only two pods down from my sleeping quarters. Like everything else in the Nereus, it was cramped 
and crowded. Although in this case it was crammed near to bursting with enough food to feed a small army, there was a microwave oven, a tiny sink, and a kitchen table that was just a square-shaped piece of metal next to the sink. Directly opposite the sink was a vast wall of panels filled with various dials and other equipment possibly meant for communications. I knew that the Nereus was connected to another underwater habitat called the Proteus, high above us and closer to the surface. They helped provide us with life support, fresh water, and breathing air. A woman in her early 30s leaned against the kitchen counter, rummaging through one of the cabinets. She looked up as I approached her. Oh, hey, you must be our new doctor, Cordelia. I'm Katie. How are you doing? How are you settling in? She had a spray of freckles across her nose and a bubbly manner that instantly put me at ease. I smiled back at her. I'm doing well, thanks. I mean, I think I'm still a little shell-shocked by everything here. I know the feeling. When I first got here, I was so nervous that I almost threw up. It gets to you, you know, how far we are from everything and everyone else. But this is the opportunity of a lifetime. She handed me a bag of freeze-dried breakfast scramble. Here you are. Before I could thank her, Katie suddenly tilted her head to one side, frowning. Hey, do you hear that? Hear what? All I heard was the occasional creaks the Nereus made. Katie still stood stock still, her eyes wide, and unblinking, her mouth slightly open as though she'd frozen in mid-sentence. I felt the first stirrings of unease, and reached out to gingerly pat her shoulder. Teddy. Her face went crumpled and hopeless. She reached out to clutch my hands, and I couldn't hold back a pain gasp. She was holding on to me tightly enough to leave bruises, scanning my face as though looking for reassurance. She spoke in a low and furtive tone of voice, like a prisoner passing on a secret message to her cellmate. The dead are in the walls. I hear them sometimes, don't you? And then, as though a tornado had passed, she went back to smiling brightly at me. What's wrong? Do I have something on my face? Katie, I think, I think you should come with me to the sick bay. She scrunched up her nose. Me, sick. No way, I feel fine. Anyway, I gotta run, doc. I stayed up all last night to keep an eye on, um, to run some experiments. If there's anything else I can do to help you out, let me know. She threw the final sentence over her shoulder as she hurried out of the kitchen. The dead are in the walls. I hear them sometimes. Riley, sitting on the bunk bed opposite mine. No, that had just been a nightmare caused by the stress of settling into an unfamiliar environment and starting a new job. Katie couldn't avoid me forever. The station was too small for that. I made my way to the sick bay, an appetizing breakfast scramble in hand. I hadn't been sure what to expect, but the sick bay was incredibly spacious. One corner of it was clearly meant to be my office. A metal bookcase next to my desk held an extensive array of medical texts, my own personal library. The rest of the room held an exam bed and a range of medical and dental equipment. There was a portable x-ray machine EKG monitor, and even facilities for me to take a blood or urine analysis. I sat down behind the desk and opened the manila folder lying on it. It had a post-it note with my name on it. Although the handwriting was so bad that the R looked like an L. Dr. Miller had left detailed notes. It looked as though he'd spent most of his time on the station taking care of rashes, sprains, colds, and dental issues, all things I felt confident about handling. As I flipped through the station personnel's medical files, I noticed that Katie had started taking sleeping pills a few weeks ago. It would be good to get her in for a basic checkup. Strike that. It would be good to get everyone in for basic checkups. I wanted to establish my own impressions about their baseline health. Movement out of the corner of my eye made me startle and dropped the medical files. I whirled around, but all I saw was a giant rust stain on the wall next to me. I propped my chin on my hands as I studied the swoops and swirls of rust. It must have been a trick of the light or the flickering shadows, but it almost seemed as though wavy fingers of rust were creeping down the door, spreading across it. A guttural scream brought me back to myself. I sprinted out of the sick bay, but I couldn't tell where the scream had come from. The air inside of the Nereus seemed oddly heavy and still like the air inside of a mausoleum that hadn't been disturbed for decades. I shook my head, annoyed with myself. Stop that, Cordelia. Get a grip. Another wordless scream rang through the air, and this time, I managed to pinpoint it to the entry lock. I ran towards it, my heart thundering so hard that I half expected it to rip itself loose from my chest. Halfway there, my feet went out from under me. I barely managed to catch myself on my palms, pain throbbing along them. 
I'd slipped on blood, a lot of blood. I scrambled back up and followed the thick trail of blood towards the pod that had been designated as our social space. It was nearly as large as the sick bay and contained two worn couches that faced one another. A long wooden table had been set between them. The walls practically burst with a spectrum of different colors. People had put up posters, photographs, artwork, and every other possible kind of wall decor. The effect was overwhelming, but that wasn't what drew my attention. Katie stood facing the wall, and she had a bloody scalpel in hand. She stood next to, next to a body, a man's unmoving, lifeless body. He was stocky, and short and wore a simple black t-shirt, and khaki shorts. I couldn't tell much else about his appearance, because Katie had cut off his face. It hung down to his neck in a loose flap of skin. The muscles in his face glistened wetly and his teeth were bared in an eternal rictus of agony. They looked impossibly white against all that blood. When I stepped closer, I noticed the series of red mouths scattered across his chest and stomach. Stab wounds. Katie rocked back and forth on her heels, mumbling incoherently to herself and slamming her head painfully against the wall of the compartment. Blood matted her hair. I couldn't tell if it belonged to her or the dead man. She didn't seem aware of my presence, but she still had the scalpel and a white knuckled grip. Someone shoved me aside, and I almost went down a second time. It was a man who'd pushed past me, a man wearing a lab coat. He was fair-haired and pale, and everything about him seemed flimsy and insubstantial, as though a stiff breeze might knock him over at any second. But he went straight towards Katie without hesitating. Katie, put the scalpel down, please. She went still. Slowly, she turned around to face us. She gouged out both of her eyes. Blood trickled down from the empty sockets, and formed a grisly bib on her MIT hoodie. There was also a white jelly-like substance smeared across her cheeks, the remains of her eyeballs. I edged closer to her. She hadn't driven the scalpel through the bone and into her brain. She wouldn't bleed out from this if we could just get the scalpel away before she did any more damage to herself. Katie uttered a broken, distracted laugh. I'm so sorry, Ben. I'm so sorry. It's all right. It's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. Just let go of the scalpel. Ben took another step closer to her. No, it's not. The doorway is open. It's wide open. And I don't know how to close it. In one swift movement, Katie dragged the scalpel across her throat. Bright red blood spurted out from the wound in rapid pulses, spraying across the ceiling. I distantly noted Ben's scream of horror as I ran past him. The front of my mind was occupied with calculating Katie's odds of survival. Her left carotid artery was most likely transected, and at this rate, she'd die within a couple of minutes. I slid down next to her and put pressure on the wound. I needed to clamp the blood vessel off. I ripped off the hem of my shirt and dug the strip of cloth through the wound to grip the artery between my fingers, pinching it tight, but it was no use. My fingers slipped and the blood pulsed right past them, making me squint against the spray. She was going into hemorrhagic shock, her skin turning clammy and cold even as her heart rate rapidly increased. Anarius didn't have any facilities for surgery and there was no way for us to evacuate her to a hospital in time. She was going to die. It's going to be okay. Katie, I said, speaking as calmly as I could. I even stroked her hair, though I doubted she could feel it anymore. You're going to be all right. Katie made a gurgling noise in her throat. She could have been trying to speak, maybe, but the sounds coming from her were slurred and unintelligible. She turned her head slightly, those empty sockets glaring straight at me, and it felt somehow as though she saw me. Even without her eyes, she saw me. Horror twisted through me, a sharp hook that threatened to unzip my guts. Part of me wanted to get up and run to leave her lying on the floor. This time, when Katie spoke again, I understood her. It's here. It's already here. And it's inside. She shuddered all over and stiffened. Then, she went limp, her jaw falling open. She was gone. I sat back on my heels, arming the sweat off my forehead, and looked around. A nameless dead man was still lying on the floor while Ben had slumped down, his head hanging down, and his legs splayed out in front of himself. He didn't speak or move. Alexandra stood a few feet beyond us. She took in the scene expressionlessly and then glanced at me in a wordless demand. She's dead. And then, because I couldn't hold the question in any longer, I added, what did she mean by the doorway is open? Day three, Alexandra had refused to tell me anything last night. Instead, she'd sent us all back to our separate sleeping quarters with strict orders to stay silent about what had happened. While she consulted mission control, they would decide whether to send another submersible to shuttle us from the Nereus and back onto dry land. Exhaustion dragged at my limbs 
As I went through my morning routine, I'd spent the night tossing and turning. Katie's words a drumbeat in my head. The doorway is open and I don't know how to close it. Despite how often I turned them over in my mind, I still didn't know what she'd meant. And every time I closed my eyes, guilt gnawed at my stomach with sharp cannibal teeth. I should have insisted that Katie accompany me to the sick bay. Maybe if I had done that, she would still be alive right now. A furtive knock on the door interrupted my thoughts, and I frowned. Striding over to it, a woman stood on the other side. She had short, spiky purple hair, and a huge tattoo of a sparrow on her right forearm. I'm Rose. Can I come inside? She kept glancing around nervously, as though afraid that someone might spot her here with me. I hesitated, memories of last night flooding me. I'd witnessed an unprompted murder only hours before. Why should I let a complete stranger enter my room? As though reading my mind, Rose added, I came to you because I heard you were there when Katie died. If you tell me what she said to you, I'll tell you the real reason we're all here. How about it? Played pro Clo. Alexandra had made it clear that everyone on the Nereus operated on a need-to-know basis. I didn't need to know what the scientists were studying, so I didn't. She didn't think that anyone else needed to know what Katie's last words had been either, and she'd be livid if she found out Rose had asked me. But I couldn't deny that I did badly want to know what Katie had meant, especially since I was stuck here for the next six months. Hold on, I told Rose. I shut the door and started digging through my duffel bag. It didn't take long to unearth my keychain. It had a range of Swiss army knives. On the other end of it, they looked ridiculously tiny and flimsy, but any kind of weapon was better than none. I slipped it into my pocket and opened the door again. Rose bolted into my room. Thanks. If Alexandra knew I was here, she'd string me up faster than you can say non-disclosure agreement. Huh. Um, you're probably wondering why I'm asking you instead of Ben. He won't talk to me. I think he blames me for all this. And I heard that John, she faltered, swallowing hard. John is dead. So, please tell me, what did Katie say to you? She said, the doorway is open and I don't know how to close it. It's inside. What did she mean by that? Damn. Rose ran her hands through her hair until it stood up in all directions and started pacing up and down the narrow aisle between the two sets of bunk beds. I knew it was a bad idea to come back here. I snagged her arm as she tried to move past me. Hey, what did Katie mean? Rose stayed silent for a moment. Finally, she murmured, it's easier if I show you. Follow me. When I didn't move, she rolled her eyes at me. I promise I'm not going to go all American psycho on you. Okay, if you want to know what's going on, then follow me. I slipped one hand into my jacket pocket, squeezing the cold, reassuring metal of the keychain, and nodded at her. She didn't waste any time. She led me straight through the main lock and up the ramp into a confusing labyrinth of hallways. In theory, the Nereus was modular, which meant that it could be taken apart and then reassembled with upgraded tech and practice that had apparently been too costly or too time consuming because they just added on more and more sections to it without taking anything out. The hallways looped around each other, intersected at random intervals and occasionally doubled back. I quickly became lost as we took one dizzying turn after the other, but Rose never faltered. We ended up in front of a pod I'd never seen before. Rose stopped with her arms crossed. It goes without saying that you can't tell anyone else about this. They wouldn't believe you. Anyway, I can hardly believe it myself, and I'm the one who found it. She smiled humorlessly and waited for my nod before sliding the door open. The inside of the pod resembled an office cubicle, a lawn. Narrow desk bordered every side, and huge stacks of paper had been scattered on it. The space was so cramped that only one person could sit down in the office chair, while the walls bristled with computer monitors. Although all of them were dark except for two, one of them showed a graph of some sort that I didn't understand, and the other seemed to be a live feed of something underwater. Rose jerked her head impatiently, and I went inside. That's what we're studying, she said, her voice low, and hushed as she pointed at the left-hand computer monitor. We found it at the bottom of the ocean, in the deepest point of the trench. 9,780 meters deep. I frowned and leaned closer to it until the tip of my nose nearly touched the screen. The image on the screen was blurry, but I thought I could see five standing stones arranged in a rough circle, each one equidistant from the other. They were roughly the same height, although they all tapered off at the top. The sight of them tugged free a memory of the time my friends and I had driven from Cambridge to Stonehenge. It had taken us two and a half hours, and it had been a huge letdown. We'd walked around the standing stones for 10 minutes, 
and then headed back. This was the reason for all the secrecy on the Nereus. A pile of rocks. Still baffled, I said slowly, so, you're studying. A monument? No, it's not a monument. Rose held my gaze. As she spoke the next few words, her dark brown eyes intent on mine. It's a doorway to an alternate dimension. I walked towards the sickbay, so occupied with what Rose had told me that I barely noticed the door had been left open. I'd asked her how they discovered it was an alternate dimension, and she launched into a scientific explanation. That had sailed straight over my head, I was only able to follow every one word in ten. The gist of it was that this alternate dimension was within spitting distance of ours, and that stepping into the space within the stones brought you there. I'd asked Rose whether Katie had been right, whether something from that other world could have come through the doorway, and onto our station. One time, we sent an ROV to collect some samples, right? As soon as it crossed into the space within the stones, bam, it disappeared. The tether was severed and all the cameras went out, but it went through, and we never saw it again. So, if something can go through from our end, she ended in an eloquent shrug. It sounded crazy. It was crazy. This kind of thing didn't happen outside of science fiction novels. I wanted to get out of here. Now, I forced myself to take a deep breath, shoving away the thin tendrils of panic that kept trying to worm their way into my brain. Stop it, Cordelia, I told myself. Focus. I wasn't getting off this station without Alexandra's say-so. I had to concentrate on what I could control. And right now, that meant looking through Katie's medical file and searching for any clues that could explain her behavior. I settled down onto my office chair and started going through the clutter of paperwork. It was amazing how much of a mess I'd managed to make yesterday morning. But as the minutes ticked by, I still couldn't find Katie's medical file or anyone else's. I frowned, drumming my fingers against the desk. I remembered hearing Katie's scream and running out of the room, leaving everything on the desk. So, where the hell were the files? A soft, High-pitched giggle broke the silence. I looked up just in time to see a flash of gray and red move past the doorway of the sick bay. Hello, I called. Who's there? No response. But that giggle had sounded familiar. Awfully familiar. My mouth went dry with dread. Is anyone there? I'm over here. Cordelia. Katie's voice. My internal temperature plummeted 20 degrees and I hastily covered my eyes as though I'd regressed back to childhood. If you can't see the bad thing, it'll go away. No, no, no. This was just an auditory hallucination, one born of stress and sleep deprivation. If I thought I could hear her giggling, that was just the hum of the generators on the Nereus. If I thought I could hear stealthy rustling noises, as though she was taking huge steps on her tiptoes, then I was wrong. Dead was dead. People didn't come back as ghosts or things that went bump in the night. I kept my hands over my eyes until my breathing had slowed to its natural pace until the fear had retreated, and I started to feel like an idiot. I opened my eyes, and Katie was right beside me. Oh my god, she was really here, her face lowered to mine. I screamed as a fresh wave of blood spilled down from her empty eye sockets, as the corners of her mouth pulled back into a bestial snarl of hatred. She spoke in an inhuman, grating voice. You let me die, just like you let Riley die. Admit it. The carrion stink of her breath wafted towards me. Horribly pungent. Horribly real. I tried to push myself away from the desk and stand up at the same time. The end result was that I fell over. The fall knocked the wind out of me, and I remained still, trying desperately to draw in a breath of air. For a sickening moment, I thought I wouldn't be able to, that I'd lie there until Katie rounded the desk and closed her hands around my neck. I shot up to my feet. The sick bay was empty. I took a couple of steps forward, stunned. Had I just imagined all of that? Through the half-open door of the sick bay, I caught a flash of movement, there and gone. When I ventured outside, Katie stood there, waiting for me. She was miraculously unharmed and whole, the same bubbly woman I'd met yesterday in the kitchen. Come on, she said brightly, almost breathless with excitement. I need to show you something, something you'll really like. My fear retreated, swallowed by the all-consuming guilt that had been my constant companion since the day Riley had killed himself. Katie was right. I had failed them both. In the months leading up to his death, it had never occurred to me that Riley was spending more and more time lying in bed, unable to muster up the energy to complete simple tasks, much less go to work. I paid no attention to the fact that his temper was shorter, that it had been months since he'd stepped out of the house to go fishing. No, I was too wrapped up in my own tedious BS, and I didn't realize 
that Riley was drowning, not waving, until it was too late to matter anymore. Katie walked away from me, and I ran after her on legs that felt like numb stilts. I needed to catch up with her. I needed to make her understand how sorry I was. But no matter how quickly I ran, Katie always remained far ahead of me, out of reach. I chased her through the main lock, an entry lock, until we arrived at the submersible docking station. It's through there, she said, pointing at the airlock. The synapses in my brain fired sluggishly, unable to make sense of what was happening. I knelt down to the airlock. Another red-orange rust stain covered the upper portion of the hatch. As I touched it, the rust pulsed under my hand, a heart, alive, and aware. It started to inch up my arm, enveloping me. I couldn't retreat, not even as it sank into my eyes, my nose, my mouth, coating the inside of my throat, until I choked on it. Indescribable agony filled me, and my surroundings blurred together, the colors running and melting, a kaleidoscope of fiery butterflies swarming him. Someone yanked me away, and unceremoniously dumped me to the ground. I looked up to find Ben standing over me, two red spots high on his cheeks. He was breathing as harshly, as though he'd just run a marathon. What is wrong with you? Miss it. I took in the flickering lights and white walls. It was the Nereus, just as it always had been. I was sitting in the compartment that held the submersible docking station, except a destructive tornado had descended on the room. Every single one of the ROVs, AUVs, and submersibles docked here had either been destroyed or set loose, and the gear used to tune them up had been bashed into tiny metal pieces. Ben continued, you were trying to open the airlock. You do realize that you would have died quickly and painfully the second you stepped out, right? And why the hell would you destroy the submersibles? Do you have any idea how much they cost? Each one is worth millions of dollars. I stared back at him, stunned. In the month leading up to my stay at the Nereus, I'd once looked up what would happen to a human being if they stepped into the depths of the ocean without any protective gear on. Severe hypothermia, inability to breathe. But worse than that, the pressure of the ocean would push in their body and cause any space filled with air to collapse, including their lungs. And even if they could get air somehow, they'd undergo nitrogen narcosis and suffocate from the inside out. If what Ben said was true, then he'd just save my life. Terror crept over me like a shroud, and I scrambled up, my clothes drenched with sweat and sticking to me. I didn't do anything to the submersibles. A horrible thought struck me. Wait, Rose told me about the doorway. Is it possible that whatever came through the doorway can make us see things? do things. Regardless of Ben's answer, I was almost certain that something on the Nereus had led me here, toyed with me, and nearly tricked me into a gruesome death. But isn't that what you deserve? Whispered a voice in my head that I couldn't be sure was mine. Rose said that. He scrubbed at his face with a hand. I shouldn't even be telling you this, but we don't know that anything's gone through the doorway at all. Katie thought so. That's what she told me before she died. It's inside. Katie wasn't in her right mind. She kept going on about how two of the stones were broken, how they would go missing every time she looked away from the monitor. She spent all her spare time there. We should have known that she needed to get back to the surface. I, I should have known. Before I could respond, a siren began to ring throughout the Nereus, a loud, mournful wail that drilled straight into my eardrums and set my teeth on edge. It was the sound of plague, death, misery. What's wrong? What does it mean? Our primary systems have gone offline. We must have shifted to our secondary systems. But that makes no sense. The Proteus should have. He broke into a run, and I followed close on his heels, praying that the siren was a false alarm. It already felt as though I'd been trapped on the Nereus for three years instead of three days. How long will the secondary systems provide us with power? We'll have at least 24 hours of power, high pressure, and oxygen, and carbon dioxide removal but we need to get in contact with mission control immediately. Without warning, the siren stopped, leaving blessed silence in its wake. But before I could huff out a sigh of relief, the lights turned off as well. I stopped in my tracks, narrowly avoiding colliding with Ben. The darkness was absolute. There was a loud metallic clatter as he knocked something over. The lights should be back on in a few minutes. He sounded as if he was trying to convince himself more than me. I shuffled after Ben at a snail's pace, one hand placed against the wall to keep track of where I was going. Why the hell weren't the lights back on yet? It had been longer than five minutes. I reminded myself not to panic, even if mission control didn't realize something had gone wrong. Proteus would. 
In fact, they'd probably send a submersible to collect us later today. In only a few hours, we would be out of the Nereus, and I'd never come back here again. Right on cue, the lights flickered back on, then hurried through the entry lock, and came to a sudden halt. I did collide with him this time, sending him staggering forward a step, written beside the kitchen pot, in huge scraggly letters that trailed off at the bottom, as though the writer had been struggling to keep their hands steady, was the following message. In the walls, I see you leave me alone. Is that blood? Ben said, sounding revolted, but we both knew the answer. The dark red words screamed at me accusingly, unable to help myself. I glanced over my shoulder as we made our way to the kitchen pot. The back of my neck tingled with the unmistakable sense that someone was watching us from the shadowy hallways. As Ben opened the door, he said, the calm, and then I lost the rest of it as someone knocked me over. They shoved me hard enough that the kitchen counter dug into my stomach with bruising force, and my head slammed against the wall. Bright stars filled my vision, and I cried out. Freezing cold hands closed around my throat. I clawed at them, but their fingers were like iron bars, relentlessly squeezing tighter and tighter. The keychain, get the keychain knife. I fumbled for it, dropped it. Gray wings unfolded over my vision. Ellen, stop. I heard Ben yell. Suddenly, the immense weight against my back disappeared. I spun around, one hand to my bruised throat as I gasped, in one breath of air after another. Ben had pulled Ellen off of me. She attacked him with her hands curled into claws and a mindless whine trapped in the back of her throat. When he caught her wrists, she simply surged forward, snapping at him like a feral animal. She was only half his size, but Ben fell back under the onslaught. I reached for the closest object at hand, a long metal cylinder, and staggered towards them. Incredibly, Ellen was breaking free of Ben's hold. She went for his eyes, and he managed to turn his head so that her nails raked down the side of his neck instead. As I approached them, Ben's eyes flicked towards me, and Ellen began to turn, but not quick enough. I brought the cylinder down hard, and she crumpled to the ground. I checked Ellen's breathing and pulse. She moaned, already stirring. I hadn't knocked her out, just stunned her. I gently rolled her onto her back and looked around for something to restrain her with. That was when I saw Rose, sitting cross-legged underneath the sink. It struck me as an odd place to sit, but I spared it only a passing thought. All my concentration was focused on her because I swallowed hard, because she disemboweled herself with one of the kitchen knives. As we watched, Rose removed another section of her small intestine through the vertical slit down her lower abdomen until the smooth, dark pink folds plopped into her lap. Then, she cut it into tiny pieces and promptly popped one into her mouth. She chewed daintily. Her brow furrowed in concentration as though she was contemplating the taste. Behind me, Ben vomited into the trash can. I walked towards her, my hands held up in a placating gesture. The immediate risk was whether Rose had damaged any vascular structures. If she'd ruptured her liver, she'd bleed out in 10 to 20 minutes. I had to stabilize Rose until we could get her to a surgeon. Rose, can you please put down the knife? I asked, trying to make eye contact and look at the knife at the same time. I expected her to ignore me, but she slowly turned to me. What's going on? I sank down on my heels, careful to telegraph my every movement ahead of time. Rose, you need to trust me, okay? I want you to hand me the knife. She blinked at me and obediently held out the knife. But before I could take it, she clamped her other hand over mine. With surprising strength, I winced, fighting the urge to back away. If I looked away now, if I showed any sign of fear, I had no doubt that she would stab me. She said urgently, Katie showed me. It's inside us already, and we can't leave. It won't let us. It made me do this to myself. Her voice was growing louder, frantic. Now, we will leave. It's going to be all right, I promise. I waited for her to say more, but she released me and slumped back. She'd passed out. Then, can you help me pull her out? I needed to determine exactly why she'd passed out and if she was bleeding from anywhere else. But Ben didn't move. He was staring at the communications panels, his mouth pressed down into a thin, flat line. For the first time, I noticed that they were a smoking, sparking ruin. Most of the dials had been twisted off, while the center of all of the panels had been gouged open, the wires torn out, and left in a tangled mess on the floor. She's destroyed our communications, he said, sounding dazed. We don't have any other way to get in contact with mission control. We're completely cut off from the outside world, and without any functioning submersibles, there's no way we can leave the Nereus within the next 24 hours. Day 4, it must have been past midnight, but I was still wide awake, slumped against the door of the sick bay. 
we had approximately 12 hours left before the Nereus' secondary systems failed. Ben had left to find Alexandra. Meanwhile, Ellen had escaped from the kitchen floor. While our attention was focused on transporting Rose to the sick bay, Rose's vital signs were stable, her breathing regular, and I determined to the best of my ability that she hadn't done any additional damage to herself other than the evisceration. In the meantime, I'd wrapped her intestine with cling wrap and sedated her with ketamine, but that was just a stopgap. We still needed to get Rose out of here and to a surgeon. Alexandra marched down the hallway, Ben trailing behind her, and I straightened up from the sick bay door. At first, I was relieved to see her, but as she approached us, I noticed the faint vertical red lines down her face as though she'd been clawing at her own eyes. She raised an eyebrow at my scrutiny. Is there a problem, Dr. Weir? I gave myself a mental shake. We need to evacuate Rose immediately. She's not going to make it for much longer. Is there any other way we can communicate with Mission Control? Or the Proteus? I mean, won't they notice when we stop replying to their messages? Standard protocol is to wait 48 hours for a response before sending a submersible. Ben said impatiently, by then, it'll be too late for us. And since you destroyed all of our submersibles, I glared at him, momentarily speechless. I didn't destroy them, but was that true? I racked my brains, thinking back to when I'd first stepped into the docking station. The submersibles had been intact then. After that though, I hallucinated the rust coming to life and opened my eyes to find everything irreparably broken. Alexandra replied, it doesn't matter who destroyed what. Either way, they're gone. Is there any other way off this station? Ben paused. With obvious reluctance, he said, well, there's the ADS-2001, but they haven't been thoroughly tested at this depth, and the Proteus is 2,000 meters above us. There's no guarantee we would make it. He saw my look of confusion and added, atmospheric diving suits. They have self-contained life support systems and thrusters. Perfect, Alexandra said crisply. She drew her gun and shot Ben. I screamed as he fell over, clutching at his shoulder. Alexandra stepped forward to shoot him again, and I rushed her, shoving her arm aside. The bullet went over Ben's head, but she slammed the butt of the gun into my jaw. I fell back, stunned. What the hell is wrong with you? I shouted, unable to even hear my own voice. The sound of the gun going off had temporarily deafened me. But as soon as I asked the question, I realized that I already knew the answer. You've been affected by something from that other world. Whatever is on the station with us. She shook her head. No, Dr. Weir. My orders from Mission Control were clear. Destroy the submersibles and ensure that no one from this station reaches the surface. Ben spoke up from where he was still lying on the ground. They're just going to let us die. Yes, and if you attempt to leave, I'll shoot you. I had to keep her talking and distracted. She wouldn't be able to hold the gun on both of us forever, and I'd take my chance as soon as she lowered it. Why does the US government want to shut the station down now of all times? I asked. What's changed? Why does it matter to you, Dr. Weir? Either way, your fate remains the same. I'm asking this as a favor. Consider it my dying wish. The least you can do before you kill us is to tell us why we have to die. She frowned, mulling this over. I'd always thought that my life would flash before my eyes right before I died, but the terror I felt right now was too great for that. I'd never been so acutely aware of my heart pounding in my chest, knowing that its beats were numbered. The muzzle of her gun seemed to widen the longer I stared at it. After a few minutes, Alexandra sighed. Fine. The lab coats think that the doorway below us is tied to our perception of it, and that Katie cracked the door open somehow. Something slipped through. They say that our entire station and everyone on it is infected. She started walking towards me again. What do you mean it's tied to our perception? How will they close the door? A passing thought struck me, something Ben had said about Katie, but it vanished. Before I could catch hold of it, Alexandra shrugged and aimed the gun at me. I closed my eyes and immediately opened them as a mindless scream rang through the air. Unnoticed by any of us, Ellen had been walking down one of the hallways. She leapt onto Alexandra's back, clawing and biting at her, her eyes as blank and shiny as a wind-up doll. I sprinted over to Ben and helped him up. We need to get out of here. He nodded, but tried to stagger off in the opposite direction. I pulled him back. I had no idea if he could hear me or not. My left ear was gradually picking sounds back up again, but my right ear remained ominously silent. I'm not leaving Rose behind. I yelled, pointing back at the sick bay. We stumbled towards it, Ben leaning heavily on me for support. 
Behind me, someone shrieked in agony, and I turned around just in time to see Alan gnawing on Alexandra's left eye. Her teeth sunk into Alexandra's flesh. Alexandra shrieked again, and flipped Alan over, slammed her head against the ground. She did this over and over again, like a woman possessed. Long passed, when Alan had already gone limp, until the back of her skull caved in. I yanked Ben into the sick bay with one giant heave, and slammed the door shut, knowing that it wouldn't be enough. We had no way to lock the door, and nothing to barricade it with. More to the point, we'd have to leave the sick bay eventually, to find the ads. All Alexandra had to do was keep us here for the next 30 or so hours, and her work would be done. Where's Rose? Then panted, and I turned around with a surge of horror to see the exam bed empty. Blood stained the sheets, more blood than anyone could have survived losing. Rose had ripped out the IV lines, and left. Despite the ketamine in her system that should have made that impossible, I never should have left her alone in here, not even for one minute. A familiar, all-encompassing guilt overwhelmed me. I briefly covered my face before forcing myself to move on. I had another patient in front of me right now. Let me have a look at that, I said to Ben, and gave his shoulder a cursory examination. He'd been lucky, the bullet hadn't gone anywhere near his collarbone. I pulled out the hemostatic gauze from the emergency first aid kit, and started plugging it into his wound. As I worked, I kept one eye on the door, half expecting Alexandra to burst through it at any second. But the Narius remained ominously silent, and it was too easy to imagine her lurking outside the door, gun held at the ready. How many rounds did she have left? I tapped Ben's uninjured shoulder, and gestured at the sling. You're all done. Good. The ads 001 s are located next to the docking. We can't go there yet. We need to find out what Katie knew. Ben jerked around in surprise. What are you talking about? What we need is to get to the ads as soon as possible, before Alexandra destroys them or the entire station shuts down. Alexandra said that Katie was the one who opened the door, I said, continuing even as he shook his head. We need to find out if there's a way for us to close the door. You remember what Alexandra said, that mission control thinks we're all infected. Alexandra's gone crazy. I doubt she actually heard anything from mission control. Ben, please, I'm doing this with or without you, but I need your help. I don't even know where Katie worked in the station. And don't you want to know what Katie meant? How she opened the door, how all of this happened? I stared at him pleadingly, willing him to say yes. Minutes crawled by as he thought it over, and I held my breath. I meant what I'd said, if I had to do this alone, I would, but I had no doubt that it would be much easier, with Ben's help. Finally, he blew out an exasperated sigh, and said, half an hour, cops, that's all the amount of time I'm willing to give you, and then I am going to leave without you, and good luck figuring out how the ADS works on your own. Half an hour is more than enough, I said, with more confidence than I felt. Before I could say anything else, Alexandra screamed wordlessly from outside the sick bay. We exchanged a startled glance, but her screams went on and on without pausing for breath, sharp as a knife's edge. My skin crawled with anticipatory dread. Just when I thought that I'd go mad if I had to listen to them any longer, they stopped. The silence spun out like shattered glass. We cautiously poked our heads out from the sick bay. The hallways were empty, Alexandra had vanished. I had no idea. What could have caused her to scream like that, and I didn't want to find out. I turned to Ben and hissed, which way? He gestured towards the curved ramp that led to the second floor. We hurried up it and into the maze of hallways. I suspected that even if I managed to escape from the Narius, I'd still see these hallways in my dreams. I'd be trapped inside of them, knowing that something was chasing me, and would catch up soon. Ben stopped us at a pod that opened onto a small laboratory. Three rows of counters stretched across the room, dozens of computer monitors, and scientific instruments on them. Underneath the counters were cabinets with black knobs. Ben headed straight towards the furthest cabinet, and started digging through it. Katie kept everything related to her research here, he said. Come on, help me look through it. I handed him various stacks of papers, and uncovered a composition book at the bottom of the cabinet. Wedged in the back, I wrenched it out, and started rifling through the pages, sending a silent apology to Katie. This had obviously been a personal journal of sorts. Some entries expressed her excitement about the Narius, while others discussed her family and friends. But the later entries became increasingly incoherent and fragmentary. She'd sometimes left sentences, or words half written across the page, and the sentences she did manage to complete were utterly nonsensical, similar to the message we'd seen earlier next to the kitchen pod. 
Near the end, she pressed her pen with such force that it had ripped straight through the paper. Ring around the rosiates everywhere on the station. Pocket full of dead leave me alone. Stop thinking about the stones you can't think or else they'll... They'll get and see you why you had. And she made drawing after drawing of the doorway below us. Scribbles of five stones in a loose circle. Underneath the very last drawing, she'd written in a desperate, unhinged scrawl, only three stones. On the other side, not five. As soon as I read the words, the image sprung into my mind, vivid and fully formed, the same circle of five stones. Below us, only one of them had disappeared, eroded into dust over the weight of millennia. Another one was a broken heap, but those two gone, there were huge, inviting gaps in the circle. And although the other three stones currently remained upright, cracked spiderweb through the bases of two of them, they would fall soon as well. Unexpected understanding struck me like a lightning bolt. If that happened, just one stone wouldn't be enough to hold the door shut. That alternate dimension would come spilling through to ours, like a pot of ink appended onto a piece of paper, staining the whole thing black. The ground rumbled underneath our feet as the doorway shook. It sent shockwaves through the water, and the Nereus then yelped and toppled over while I grabbed for the edge of the counter to steady myself. The earthquake only lasted for a handful of seconds, but it left us both trembling and pale. She was studying the samples. Ben gasped out. They always told us that the ROV disappeared and never came back. But samples of what? Samples taken from the other dimension. It says so in her lab reports. Let's get out of here. He shakily got to his feet and we rushed out of the lab. It was utterly insane. Something I had no idea how to express to Ben. But I knew on a bone deep level that defied rational explanation that my split second mental image of the doorway as three stones instead of five had caused the earthquake that had somehow shaken the stability of the doorway. Even worse, for that infinitesimal fraction of a second, I'd sensed that something vaguely serpentine waited on the other side of the doorway, coiled up against it, a vast, incomprehensible abomination that was inexorably forcing the door open. An ear-splitting siren blared throughout the station, the same one we'd heard yesterday. The lights flickered and began to shut off in the pods, one by one, what the hell was happening? I yelled to Ben. Alexandra, she must have done something to the secondary systems. We flew through the hallways. A stitch burned in my side, and my throat still hurt from Ellen's attack. I wanted more than anything to sit down. But that wasn't going to happen anytime soon. Not if I wanted to stay alive. Every minute we took to navigate through another intersection of hallways seemed to last a year. Finally, we reached the ramp that led down to the first floor. We sprinted down it and into the submersible docking station. Ben led me straight to a door that I'd walked past a dozen times, already without ever noticing. The pod was filled with a mess of machinery. I couldn't even pretend to understand their purpose, but one thing was clear. Those were the atmospheric diving suits, hanging from the ceiling. Two of them, they resembled bulkier versions of spacesuits, but shiny silver, and with black bands going down the limbs. Ben tapped a series of buttons, into the keypad next to them, an unseen machinery above us whirred to life, slowly moving the ads towards the submersible docking station. We ran back there to wait for them, Ben pacing around in tight circles. How do the suits work? I asked. I had to yell to be heard over the siren. You should be able to walk around in them normally while we're on dry land. Once you go into the water, you've got to flip a switch on your arm to activate the thrusters. Foot pedals inside the suit will allow you to move. You've also got manipulators at the end of each arm so you can grab objects. We'll put on the legs first, then the top half. The vacuum pump will create a hydraulic seal. The suits arrived at the docking station, and we clambered onto the raised platforms to put them on. Stepping into the suit felt like stepping into a coffin. It was difficult to manipulate, and it didn't help that I barely knew how it worked. Ahead of me, Ben stepped over to the airlock and slammed a fist down on the button to open it. I allowed myself to feel a surge of cautious relief against all odds. We were leaving the Nereus. You can't leave. I turned around and screamed. The tottering figure that stood in the doorway of the pod only somewhat resembled the woman Alexandra had been. At first glance, her body seemed to have turned into scraps of metal subsume by rust. She turned a face towards me that was a glowing golden blur. As she walked towards us, a wave of rust raced out from her feet. This had to be what Alexandra had meant when she'd said that we were all infected, all of us, because that couldn't be rust. It wasn't. Ordinary rust didn't ride like that, alive and aware, constantly swirling together to form patterns before breaking apart. It didn't breathe. 
I backed away, but the weight of the suit hampered my movements. Every step backwards took an immense amount of effort. And at the back of my mind, a panicked voice yammered. It's been on the station this entire time. You've even touched it. You've been breathing it in. Abruptly, the knot rust formed thick bulging masses across her entire body. The one on her upper thigh transformed into a familiar face, Katie's. It happened again and again until the faces of the dead were staring at me from Alexandra's body. I saw a man's face, one I didn't recognize, and remembered Dr. Miller's inexplicable departure from the Nereus. He hadn't left at all. The knot rust was constantly in motion and their faces seemed to laugh or scream or both at once. I realized with numb horror that everyone who died on the Nereus so far had achieved a hellish kind of immortality. When Alexandra spoke again, it was the voice of the Nereus as it creaked and groaned under the immense pressure of the ocean depths. You don't want to leave. Each word sliced through the noise of the siren clearly. It was true. A tiny part of me wanted to stay. I wanted this nightmare to end. And maybe that same tiny part of me wanted to help open the doorway below us to go through it and to let the knot rust take over me. It was already inside of me, and the process would be simple, quick, painless. Around us, the Nereus trembled. It was transforming where the knot rust touched it, turning into a structure made from alien flesh and bone. Its walls shivered, covered with peeling skin and glowing red-orange veins. The ground squelched underneath me, soft and spongy. My feet stuck to it with every step. The entire station breathed and pulsed with unspeakable life. What ultimately cut through my longing was the memory of Alexandra's screams, how they turned into horse barks near the end. It wouldn't be painless at all. I backed up until I was next to a stack of unopened crates and Alexandra lurched towards me with a frightening burst of speed. She raised her arms to embrace me, summoning every last scrap of strength. I grabbed onto the closest crate and swung it at her. She screamed in baffled rage and I ran for the airlock, knowing that I was literally running for my life. Nothing could have prepared me for the fear that ate through me like acid and the wild exhilaration that accompanied that fear in defiance of all common sense. I'd only given myself a few seconds head start, but it turned out that a few seconds was all I needed. Every muscle straining with effort, I threw myself into the airlock. Ben slammed the door shut, already keying in the sequence to open the second door that led out directly into the sea. We left the Nereus, and not a moment too soon. The lights from the Nereus shut off all at once, the ever-present hum of the generators dying into silence. I had one split second to revel in our freedom before I started to sink. The darkness around me was impenetrable. I thought of what waited below in the trench and screamed. Lead lights blinded me and the radio and my suit crackled to life. Then said, directly into my ear, use your foot pedals. Pushing down on your right toes will move you forward and the heel will move you backwards. Pushing down on the left toes will move you down, while the heel moves you up. Right, I had foot pedals. I flipped the switch to activate the thrusters and pressed down on the left foot pedal gingerly. The ads took me upwards at an odd angle, and I crashed into the side of the Nereus and rebounded. When I stopped pushing on the pedal, I immediately sank again. At least the suit was much easier to move in the water. How do you have lights? An unpleasant thought struck me, and how much oxygen do we have? The lead lights are located on your arms, and the ADS-2001 has two separate oxygen systems, with a total capacity of 25 hours of life support. The air inside of the suit is filtered and recirculated by carbon dioxide scrubbers. After a few fumbling moments, I manage to turn the lead lights on and breathe the sigh of relief. The darkness of the abyssal zone still pressed down around me, but the lights illuminated my immediate surroundings. That was good enough for me. Whereas I struggled with every movement, Ben used his suit without any difficulty. He pointed at something barely perceptible in the distance. We need to follow the umbilical from the Nereus to the Proteus. Our pace was hampered by my incompetence with the suit, and I tried not to dwell on the fact that it seemed like I'd need every last one of those 25 hours of life support. Despite Ben's concern, the suits were holding up well, at least as far as I could tell. We followed the umbilical, which was comprised of hoses that supplied air from compressors, oxygen from storage flasks, and power lines from the generators. Hours passed. Ben and I didn't talk much, both of us lost in thought. Now that we were out of immediate danger, the events of the past few days played through my mind on a grisly loop. I thought of Katie, Rose, John, Ellen, and Alexandra, and of all the ways they'd either murdered one another or themselves. 
I hadn't been able to save anyone. Most of all, I thought of all the times I'd touched the knot rust, blissfully ignorant of what it actually was. Was it inside of me right now, a seed of infection waiting to flower? And if so, what did that mean for the rest of my life? Would the Navy quarantine us, or leave us to die? I'd been mindlessly following the umbilical. All my attention turned inwards, so our arrival at Proteus caught me by complete surprise. It was a simple one-story structure in the shape of a long tube, not unlike the first floor of the Nereus. But there were no pods or hallways protruding from it, and it was half the size. Lights shone down on us cheerily, and I paused, uncertain. Going inside the Proteus meant telling everyone what had happened on our station. It meant everyone scrutinizing my decisions and actions and living with the consequences of them. Ben, however, didn't share my hesitation. He maneuvered himself up to the airlock and started punching in the sequence to open it. I stared at him, amazed. How do you know the codes to open the Proteus's airlock? We might have been assigned to the Nereus, but scientists often rotate between the two stations. My stint at the Proteus ended only a week ago. I'm surprised they didn't change the codes yet. A loud hiss sounded as the lights around the airlock blinked, and the door opened. I clumsily followed Ben inside, surrealness descending over me. It didn't seem possible that we'd left the Nereus and made it to the Proteus. They'd be able to get into contact with mission control. They'd have working submersibles. In less than a day, we'd be getting the hell out of here. I took off the suit, sighing in relief as its heavy weight disappeared. I definitely strained my back while running to the Nereus's airlock, then began to slide open the door that led to the main compartment of the Proteus. Why hasn't anyone greeted us yet? They should have noticed the airlock opening from the outside. Before I could think of an answer, the door slid open and provided one for us. Everyone on the Proteus was dead. Corpses were scattered throughout the main compartment. They'd all died violently, either at their own hand or the hands of others. One woman had fashioned a noose out of wires and clawed at her own eyes as she died. Two others had apparently beaten each other to death, their faces so much raw meat. A man had broken a glass beaker and jammed a bouquet of shards into his own throat. Even worse, the knot rust bloomed from every square inch of the station. It swirled and shifted as I looked at it, as protein as the sea. There was no escape from it. The hiss of a door ceiling shut shook me out of my stupor. I turned around and saw Ben inside of the airlock. He didn't have his suit on. Horror threatened to drown me, and I tried to tug the door back open. What are you doing? I demanded, knocking on the door to get his attention. He turned towards me, face slack and eyes glazed, mumbling unintelligible words under his breath. I yanked at the door, pummeled it, not caring if I scraped my knuckles raw. Get back here, Ben. Right now, I couldn't lose him too. There's no point, Cordelia. The doorway is opening. Can't you see it? He gave me a beatific smile. Three stones, not five. And once again, the image pierced my mind. One stone was already gone, the other lying in a broken heap. Two more swayed on their foundations, huge cracks splitting them down the middle. A smoldering orange red light, the light from an insane alien sun, began to spill out from the space within the circle. It pulsed with avid greed, twisting everything in its path. I fell to the ground, clutching my head uselessly, as the Proteus shook. I tried to imagine five standing stones again, all five upright and whole as I'd first seen them. I might as well have tried to stop breathing. The image of the two broken stones kept intruding, and every time I pictured it in my mind's eye it grew more solid. I somehow knew that if I didn't stop thinking about the broken stones in that other dimension, the stones in our world would break too, their reality, overriding ours. When that happened, that unspeakable thing would break through followed by a whole host of other abominations. With an effort, I wrenched my mind away from the doorway. The shaking subsided instantly. I scrambled up to my feet, running back to the airlock, hoping I wasn't too late. But it was empty. Ben was gone. I was the only one left. An interminable amount of time passed. When I looked up, Riley was standing over me. His eyes were two bleeding holes, and maggots wormed their way out from underneath his peeling fingernails. I didn't have the strength left to speak. He held out his hand to me in a wordless demand, and I took it. As he led me through the Proteus, I tried not to look at the corpses. Each one seemed to be glaring at me accusingly, their faces twisted in hatred. It didn't take us long to arrive at the sick bay. The scalpels gleamed under the fluorescent lights. Now, I told him. I backed away, shaking my head. Riley said nothing. He simply held one up, waiting. The night my husband killed himself, I was lying on our living room sofa, watching an old TV show. 
I don't remember which one. I noticed Riley humming as he walked through the kitchen and up the stairs, and I heard the bedroom door slamming shut, but it didn't occur to me to check on him. He seemed so much better lately, more like his old self, cracking jokes, leaving the house again. I eventually decided that I would go up and talk to him as soon as the next commercial break started. But a few minutes later, a gunshot echoed through our house. I raced up the stairs, taking them two at a time, my heart in my throat. The bedroom door was locked, and I had to call 911 to break down the door. By the time they arrived, I already knew what we would find inside. A bullet had exited the back of Riley's head, turning it into a blood-soaked ruin, and we found the drying remains of his brain splattered against the yellow wallpaper. I did that. I let him die. I took the scalpel, its cold edge biting into my hand. This was a way out of the nightmare of the past few days. More importantly, I deserved this. Riley nodded in agreement, his head moving jerkily. I raised the scalpel and set the tip against my abdomen. I'd hit the abdominal aorta and bled out within minutes, but memories started to flood me. The first date Riley and I had had at a board game cafe in Boston. Our fall tradition of going apple picking and getting cider donuts, and how he'd hidden my engagement ring inside the basket meant for our apples. Most of all, I remembered that wry grin of his, and the way it lit up his whole face. Suddenly, I sensed Riley's presence. He was here with me now. Not this pale imitation of him that the knot rust had spun out of my guilt, and that still stood in front of me, waiting for me to plunge the scalpel into myself. But the Riley I'd known, and loved. The Riley who'd loved me, and who'd never blamed me at all. Tears pricked the corners of my eyes. Even though I badly wanted to, I couldn't give up now. Not when I still had work to do. It was the hardest thing I'd ever done. But I managed to uncurl my fingers one by one until the scalpel dropped to the ground with a loud clang. And then, I turned away and went in search of the communication panels. I did find them, and they seemed to still be working. So, I found a computer and wrote up my experience of the past few days. Alexandra said that the scientists think the doorway is somehow tied to our perception. It's my personal theory that the things on the other side of the doorway gained a foothold in our world through Katie's mind after she studied the samples from their world. That was enough to wedge the door open a few inches. And because I've been on the Nereus, breathing in that not rust, they've managed to infect my mind as well. Now that I've read her notes and seen the stones broken, only three of them left. I can never unsee them that way. And every time I think of them, it weakens the doorway some more. They've found a foothold through my mind too. If someone is reading this right now, please imagine five standing stones at the bottom of the ocean. Not three, but five. Five stones in an unbroken circle, tapered off at the top and equidistant from one another. Whole and upright. I'm not sure if that will be enough to close the door again, but we have to try. Because otherwise, our world will become an extension of theirs, an insane hellscape with three suns in the sky, and a feverish, hungry light, and the worst of it is that none of us will die. My idea still has 22 hours of oxygen left. I could try to make it up to the surface, but my current plan is to find a way to destroy both the Proteus, and the Nereus, and the Knot Rust on both stations. I have to do it before the Navy decides to send anyone else down here who might become infected too. I've sent this message to everyone I know, and now I'm posting this message to everywhere I can think of, in the hopes that it will reach as many people as possible. I don't think I'm going to make it back up. I'll see you soon. Riley, I love you.